Greetings in the name of Jesus. We're so happy to see you here. And we want to stand this morning in the presence of the Lord. This is a new day. A day that we have never seen before. And we can give God all the glory and all the praise and all the honor. He deserves it. Yes. He deserves our Hallelujah. glory. He deserves our praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we love you. Yes. We love you, Lord. Yes. Because you first love us. You died on that cross so that we could be redeemed. Hallelujah. And Father, we are bowing in your presence this morning. Thanking you for your goodness and your mercy that have brought us through. Without you, God, where would we be this morning? We can do things in ourselves, but we still need you. We need you to be our provider. We need you to be our deliverer. We need you to be our helper. We need you gone in every stage in our lives. And Father, we thank you, Lord, for your protection during the course of the week. We could have been elsewhere, but Lord, we are here in your sanctuary to thank you, Lord, to thank you and to glorify your name. Father, we bring this service into your hands, Lord, as we minister to your people in song. Lord, we thank you that our people would have brought a sacrifice of praise into your presence. Yes, we bring a sacrifice oh, this morning. Yes, we Jesus. offer up a sacrifice Jesus. to you this morning. Hallelujah. And as we offer up a sacrifice, Lord, we know that you are going to bless us. You're going to deliver us. You're going to heal us. Whatever need we have this morning, we know that you're going to take care of it. And Father, we declare that you will be here. We know that you're here, but we declare your presence. We declare, dear God, that whatever the enemy is set up to do this morning, that he would be defeated in the name of Jesus. God and Master Lord, you will just stay itself out of the way. As we worship you and we honor you, because it is due unto you. And Father, you said in your word, let everything yes. that have breath this morning... Yes. Praise the name of the Lord. We honor you and we glorify you this morning in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. I just want to read a short psalm. Make a joyful noise. Or my, my Bible says, make a joyful shout to the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. Yes. It is he who have made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. Hallelujah. For the Lord is good. Yes, he is. His mercy is everlasting. It never fails. Hallelujah. And his truth endures to all generation praise the lord here end of the reading of the word hallelujah praise the lord we want to begin our worship by singing that song we have come to worship the lord however way you want to do it you just let god have his way forget about the person next to you in front of you behind you and you want to worship god this morning in the beauty of holiness Hallelujah. Praise the Lord.
worship the Lord. Bow down before Him, love and adore Him. We have come to worship the Lord. Enter in, into the holy place. Enter in, and look upon His face. He is worthy. into his presence this morning praise the lord he have done so much that our tongues will come short of giving god the glory and the praise we want to sing praises unto god sing praises hallelujah praise the lord
years of feel like running and skipping. Jesus. I don't know when you get joy in your soul and yeah. joy that something happened. Oh. Sometimes you got to do something. Yes. You can't keep quiet. No, no. Praise the Lord because he has done so much for me. Yes. He has set my spirit, my spirit free. Oh. Hallelujah. We all are free people in here this morning. We have liberty that we can worship and we can thank God for his goodness and for his mercy. Hallelujah. So many people are shut away. So many people have to hide to even call the name of Jesus. But we can shout it to the mountaintop. We can shout it that everyone can hear this morning because that he has set our spirits free. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord for what he has done for me. My God is awesome. Yes, he is. Hallelujah. He is a great God. He's a mighty God. Yes. He's the King of Kings and He's the Lord of Lords. Hallelujah. And it's our duty this morning to tell Him how much we care. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I will praise you, Lord, with every breath that I take. You know what it is to get up every morning? I realize that you are breathing. You have to open your eyes at 5, 6, 7, 8, which is my favorite time. And realize that you are breathing. And you can say, God, I thank you. I thank you for a breath. Hallelujah. I thank you, Lord, because man couldn't give it to me. The doctors couldn't give it to me. But only you, only my God and my Savior, he can have given us breath this morning and strength as well and health as well that we can come here this morning to worship you hallelujah oh when eternity comes even then hallelujah thank you lord thank you lord i will praise you lord with every breath that i take I will praise you, Lord, this promise I made, I should eternity end, and start all over again, even then, I will praise you. Lord, it's because you have a goodness, Lord. We thank you, Lord. 
We thank you, Lord, that you have given us the breath there, Lord, that we can breathe. You give us the speech there, Lord, that we can talk. You give us the speech that we can sing, hallelujah. There's no one like you, God. You are God over all the earth, hallelujah.
There is a higher place of praise as we stand in awe of you. We want to move up to that higher place this morning. We want to see you in all your glory. We want to see you in all your majesty. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you. Lord, we worship you.
two cities, the earth and the heavenlies, the sacrificial lamb and the adversary, the lamb of God who breaks the seals to be seen of the horses and the beasts. Are nations buying and selling out their people in their playgrounds of power and greed as like a commodity to the hierarchy, waging war and rumors of wars? A spiritual empire attack, darkness strikes by the beasts on the horses' backs of white, black, red, pale. To deceive and conquer, pulling the rug from under a false peace and insecurity. Bloodshed, death, famine, and hunger, having us to suffer, time short, Eternity long, days prolonged. Seek the Son of God while he can be found. The prideful souls of man themselves as a gift, going down to hell in a basket. The apocalypse, the unveiling of things to come. Faithful and true is the one. The beginning and the end until the day is done. The end. Permit me an opportunity just to go into a little bit of a, a recap as we contemplate the things we've already come through beginning last Sunday as we talked in terms of this very important series, The Approaching Apocalypse. Now, let me hasten to tell you that the service from last Sunday is online on our Facebook page and our YouTube channel. That's our Calvary Temple Community Church Facebook page and YouTube channel. As a matter of fact, as I speak to you right now, that service from last Sunday is premiering or premiering um, on our channels and pages there, respectively. Um, so I won't take too much time, but just a quick recap for those of you who are in-house with us. Good morning to a watching world as well as we look back, uh, just a little sneak peek back at what took place last Sunday and prep our hearts for what will take place today. So we're talking about Revelation chapter 6, and we're combing through these important verses. Uh, we talked in terms of the fact that we came out of Revelation chapter 4 and 5. Those two chapters afforded us an amazing opportunity to have... Uh, a semblance of joy as you were seated in heavenly places. That's Revelation chapter 4 and 5. We saw ourselves seated where? In heavenly places. Joy unspeakable and full of glory. And then suddenly, very quickly, as we moved on into chapter 6, we, were, we found ourselves in earthly places. And we moved to a place of judgment. From joy to judgment. Very, very Suddenly, from jubilation to everything being very jaded and popped down. <laughs> so, the chapter 6 before us uh, represents the seven uh, seals. And uh, as we keep reading throughout that book of Revelation, we come to seven trumpets. We also come to seven bowls. So, there are three different types of judgment. The seven seals, the seven trumpets... The seven bowls. Would you say them with me? Seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls. Now, we're not going to get into the trumpets or the bowls in this particular series. This series in the month of August will afford us only the opportunity 
and the five weeks to treat to the seven seals. Last Sunday, we looked at the first two seals. Today, we look at the next two seals. The four seals, that's the two from last Sunday, and the two from today, two and two is four. The four seals are represented by four horsemen and their horses, okay? I think everybody should get that by now. The four seals, two from last Sunday, two from today, are represented by the four horsemen. Each seal represents a horseman, okay, and its horse. I refer to the horse or the horses as stallions, and hence the name of the message from last Sunday and again today, the stallion of the revelation, the stallion of the revelation. Last Sunday was part one, <clears throat> and today is part two. So as we look through those uh, four seals, four horses, four horsemen, we will come then to the remaining three Sunday mornings in this month where we will prayerfully, by the grace of God and with your help, with your presence, and you're inviting other people, we will be able to cover the remaining three seals, seal number five, seal number six, and seal number seven. Okay? We contemplated the fact that we're dealing with a period of time called the Great Tribulation. Revelation chapter 6 all the way through to Revelation chapter 19. Those 14 chapters, as I mentioned to you last Sunday, Revelation 6 to 19, all inclusive. 14, you can do the math. You can reckon it, 6 to 19, all inclusive. 14 chapters represent a seven-year period of time. 14, two sevens, 14 chapters. See how God does math. 14 chapters cover a seven-year period of time. Okay, everything line upon line, precept upon precept. And uh, we recognize that those 14 chapters are there or thereabouts in the center, roughly speaking, of the book of Revelation. And if you pop them out, you will see the seven years of absolute chaos, mayhem, suffering, and pain, unadulterated pain, like you and I would never even want to imagine, far less experience. And we're made to understand that the seven-year period of tribulation, great tribulation, is divided into two equal parts, two equal three-and-a-half-year periods of time. The second half is worse than the first half. You remember what I said last Sunday? We go from turbo to turbular. <laughs> it, it, it's serious stuff. I know that's a little opportunity for you to smile a little bit behind the mask that's suffocating you. But please understand, it is actually no joke. It is serious, serious stuff. When everything falls apart and the bottom of life as we could ever know it drops out. All right? We also understood that uh, the church would have been removed by this time. The rapture takes place before the first of seven seals are broken. This is the judgment of God. It's not the judgment of a man, the judgment of the devil, the judgment of, of a leader, <clears throat> a president. A prime minister, it is the judgment of God. And before he judges the, the, the irreverent and impenitent persons, obnoxious and stiff-necked people who are left behind, he will remove his bride. He will remove his blood-washed bride. So you may say, Pastor, why are we here? Why are we even talking about this chapter 6 and all the way through to 19 if the church is not going to be here? So that you and I can wake up, get serious, and make sure, first of all, that we are not going to be left behind. And secondly, that we warn others so that no flesh has to go through this. This is something that you want not even your worst enemy to have to go through. If the person has a heart that is beating blood, and they, they have any, any kind of, 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 of soul, you don't want this for them. I don't care how much you hate the body. You don't want this for them. But this is going to happen for a lot of people because they refuse to repent. We're made to understand the statisticians and researchers, theologians tell us, 19 times you find the word church mentioned in the first five chapters of the book of Revelation. 19 times the church, 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 
five chapters. Then when you come to chapter 6, all the way through the 19, how many times is the church mentioned? <laughs> you can't find one mention of the church. Why? She's not there. She's removed. God promised that he would rescue us, that he would save us from that hour of great tribulation. Give him a mighty hand of praise. If you are part of the church. And so we saw the white horse of deception as well as the red horse of demolition. The white horse represented that first seal, horse of deception. And uh, we saw that from verse 6, uh, chapter 6, verse 2, sorry, chapter 6, verse 2, the white horse. And that was the white horse, I couched it as a white horse of deception. There is a spirit of delusion and deception that is already at work in the earth, in the world. God promised that he would turn those, those irreverent persons who refuse to repent, impenitent individuals, over to a spirit of delusion, uh, sorry, strong delusion. Not just delusion. The Bible says strong delusion. And it is already at work in the earth. When persons turn on your TV and everything you see on the TV, you swallow it. Because it's mainline media. So it must be the truth. But the Bible, you have a problem believing. God has already begun the process of turning unbelievers and this entire world godless system over to a strong spirit of delusion. And so we saw that this first seal represents the Antichrist, spirit of deception, and that white horse uh, it marks that type of deception that's already at work in the earth. We saw that he'll be a man of solutions, having all the answers when he comes. He'll be a man of strength and, uh, and uh, influence. And also he'll be a man of sham. We also saw the red horse of demolition. And we understood that this had to do with war. War on a colossal scale that has never been seen before. And we saw the peace treaty that will be demolished. Completely broken and done away with. <clears throat> and then we saw that this planet will be decimated. We saw how the planet will be decimated. So that's the white horse and the red horse. Today... We jump on in now to the business at hand of the next two horses in the next two seals. Seal number three and seal number four. Revelation chapter six, verse five to eight. Revelation six, verse five to eight. That uh, will get our attention for today. And the first of three... First of two, sorry, first of two seals will be found in verse 5 and 6. So I speak to us today now on the business of the stallion of the Revelation, part 2, as we look at the third seal represented by the third horse. And it's horseman, the black horse of deprivation. The black horse of deprivation. And uh, if you're taking notes, you should probably see it pop up there on the screen. Good. Thank you so much, Omari. And so you can get your spelling down if you're not sure about that. But basically, the point here is that there are a lot of things that we are used to in our generation and in our culture that we will be deprived of during that time of the great, rebel, great uh, tribulation. Please understand, I'm saying, I'm using the word we, but maybe I shouldn't because I don't plan to be here. <laughs> and I hope that you won't be either. But for those who will be left behind in the great tribulation, a lot of things that currently today we are used to, they will not have. <laughs> things that we are used to now, they will not have then. So a lot of things you will be deprived of if you are left behind. The first two verses, verse 5 and 6, Revelation chapter 6 Verse 5 and 6, get our attention, reading from the Amplified Version. When he, the Lamb, broke open the third seal, we're now into the third seal, I heard the third living creature call out, Come! I looked, and behold, a black horse of famine. I like how the Amplified reads because it helps you to understand things that in another transliteration you might not quite get. So it reads there for us, a black horse of famine. 
And the writer had in his hand a pair of scales, a balance, what some may refer to as a balance. Verse 6, and I heard something like a voice in the midst of four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius, a day's wages, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not damage the oil and the wine. You can almost hear that voice ricocheting throughout the generation that will exist then. A godless, backslidden generation that is stiff-necked and refuses to repent even though opportunities like this one comes to it today. A quart of wheat for a denarius, a day's wages, and three quarts of barley for a denarius. And do not damage the oil and the wine. You can almost hear the words coming forth as this third seal is broken. And the scroll of God unfurls the judgment of God on those who are left behind. The third seal has now been broken, church. <laughs> you and I are out of here. But I fear for those who are in our contacts lists who we have not yet witnessed to, whose blood will be required on our hands because we are ashamed to tell them that Jesus Christ is Lord and that we have chosen to serve him. This rider makes his appearance. This horse is black. Black has been the color associated with many things. Not least of which is famine. Famine. Hunger. The Apostle John's description of this third horse and rider is again brief. He provides us only two pertinent details. The black color of the horse and the rider's pair of scales. That's all that we find there in that uh, verse as we read it in verse 5. Okay? That's all that we see in terms of details in verse 5. We have the color of the horse. You see that, church? And then we have the rider's, the horseman's pair of scales. Now, both of these details point to an overall interpretation of famine. Both of these details that we've been given. Which verse 8 verifies by using the words power to kill with the sword and with famine. If you just slip down to verse 8. And let's look at that. Reading from the Amplified. Verse 8 says. So I looked. Now this is a different seal. This is a different seal. So don't get confused. But I want you to see something here. Because it is almost as though. Though it's a different seal. The writer John. Under the influence of the spirit of God. Is marrying what he just saw in the third seal. With what he's beholding in the fourth seal. He says in verse 8, So I looked and behold an ashen, pale greenish gray horse, like a corpse representing death and pestilence. We're going to get to that just now. And its rider's name was Death, and Hades, the realm of the dead, was following with him. They were given authority and power over a fourth part of the earth to kill, okay, with the sword and with famine. You see that? To kill with the sword and with famine. And then it continues on there. Okay. So I want us to see that verse 8 uh, almost endorses what we read in verse 5. Where it talks in terms of power to kill with the sword and with famine. Famine always follows the aftermath of war. Famine always follows in the aftermath of war. That, that standard procedure. Coming on the heels of the red horse, which represented war, as I mentioned to you last week and a few moments ago, it is reasonable then to conclude that this black horse, right after the red horse, represents famine and scarcity. Right behind war, now we have a horse and its rider representing famine and scarcity. Therefore, global wars will brood global famines. Global wars will brood 
or give way to global famines. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. You with me? Jesus spoke of this in Matthew 24 and verse 7. Matthew 24, 7. I'll read it for you. For a nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. So right after the warning of war, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, well, that's war. Right behind that, Jesus says, not an apostle, not a pastor, not a bishop, not a nice person, not your best friend, not your mother, not your father, not your husband or your wife. Jesus says, right behind that, there will be famine. You with me? Famine. So one will open the door for the other. Now, quickly, I want you to see three seasons coming up as a result of this particular seal being broken. Three seasons. And they're going to happen, boom, boom, boom. One after the other, almost simultaneously. First of all, a season of shortages. A season of shortages. In light of this black horse, this third seal, this third stallion, this third jockey, I want you to see the deprivation that will take place. A season of shortages. The rider on this horse has in his hands a set of scales. This indicates that the tribulation period will be marked by severe shortages in the necessities of life. Apparently, the famines will be so severe that food and other basic necessities will have to be rationed. Good morning. Will have to be rationed. You know they're already talking about this, incidentally. If you're, if you're following any kind of, of news networks and during your research, those both mainline, sometimes my wife asks me, why are you always listening to that mainline thing, <laughs> CBS4? I like to watch CBS4 Miami on an evening uh, around 5, anytime between 5 and 6.30 uh, in the evening, between Monday to Friday. I like to watch CBS4 Miami. Uh, so why are you always watching that foolishness? <laughs> Because, I, I tell it straight, because I want to know what's going on in the States. I've come to understand that when America do so, huh, 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 guess what happens to Barbados? Influenza in the hospital laying down, stricken. America only has to sneeze. And the whole Caribbean got the flu. I like to watch some American news. And then I balance that. You got to balance it. With some other stuff that they would never put on their platforms. Because they don't want you to know what's going on. But I hide that. But I, I just dig it up. <laughs> I just dig it up so I can get a balanced portfolio. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? So if you're tracking the news at all, you will understand they're already talking about rationing stuff. Few of us know about having to do without, though. That's, that's what I've noticed. This generation that we're, that we're, we're in today and in, and in recent times, few of us know about having to do without. Many of us today can go to a supermarket or a mall. Not all of us. But a lot of us, supermarket or a mall, and shot till we drop. Hmm? Jump on a plane and shop, shop, and come back. And I'm not complaining because sometimes when they come back, they give me a little something. <laughs> so I, I'm not complaining. Go by all means, just remember me in Miami. <laughs> I got a t shirt. Somebody in Miami loves me. Hallelujah. Never seen those t-shirts before. <laughs> Amen. But some can do that. And, and, and for some of us, our larders, if you still have larders at home, our larders and refrigerators, our cupboards and freezers are sometimes, more often than not, filled to the brim. Plenty we got enough, man. Few of us in this generation know about having to make do with just a little bit. Just a little bit. We don't know the saying, eat little and live long. Y'all know that? I grew up hearing that. Eat little, boy, and live long. 
I was telling my children the other day, the other night, about especially Adania, because she don't understand these things, about having to just, just get a little Milo, a little biscuit and go to bed. You had breakfast? Good. You had lunch? Praise God. No, will you come back for dinner? What? Dinner what? Huh? You don't need dinner. Get a little bit of Milo, Shatoria. A little bit of Milo and a cup. Hmm? A snap, a snap cup. A snap, a shot glass of Milo. <laughs> huh? And, 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 and a, little, a little biscuit with some, with some butter and cheese. And, and thank God and go to, go to bed, man. That's enough. What, what dinner? We're looking now for, for what? More chicken. <laughs> We, we, we have a generation, and sometimes I think we spoil them. When I grew up, I had my Milo, man, and it was good with that. My wife told me, she ain't buying a Milo for the children. Milo? That thing tastes disgusting. <laughs> I don't even know if you can still get Milo. You still get it? Okay. For me, I just get my coffee, and I'm good. I'm good. Some tea. Uh, is that right, Doc? You don't need a whole meal again. Come on. We've got a generation that's coming up on our heels. And they don't know about eating a little and living long. But that day is coming. I want to tell you that day is coming again when you can have to do that for those who are left behind. Again, I am told that during World War II, I, I wasn't here. <laughs> but research tells me that the military's demand for certain goods increased dramatically. The military's demands. They put the demands on the populace around the world. And there were shortages. Things that we took for granted like sugar, milk, the same coffee that I mentioned a few moments ago, butter, cheese, meat, canned foods and tin goods, corned beef and this kind of thing, shoes, a pair of shoes, gasoline, things that we take for granted. Well, maybe we really don't take gas for granted too much now because... I see the prices. Mm -hmm. We can already see a semblance of what I'm talking about going on. Where, there, where the demand is great and the supply is low, what happens to the price? It goes up. That's basic economics. That's economics 101, dog. And we're already seeing these things happen. So these things that we, we, we sometimes take for granted or we've been taught how to take them for granted... These things during World War II were very scarce and they were rationed. I made to understand that uh, you had a situation where <laughs> gas was limited to three gallons. Gas. Three gallons of gas per ration period. I don't know. I couldn't find out what the ration period was. I don't know if it was a week or a month or whatever, but that ration period, whatever it was, Three gallons of gas had to cover the household, each household during World War II. Three gallons of gas. And then this one, well, this one blew me away. Coffee. Coffee was rationed apparently at one pound for a five-week period. One pound of coffee had to cover an entire household for five weeks. Now, if you like me and you love coffee, <laughs> I had a cup this morning. I'd like another cup right now. Where the storage? No, just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> hmm? If you like me, and some households, both spouses drink coffee. For me, it's only my one. My wife don't drink coffee. So it's just my one. The children don't drink coffee. It's just my one. I love my coffee. So I might have been able to make it. But for those persons where you got to share the pot of coffee for five weeks, you must have did. I, that's hard knocks. I would have died. <laughs> that's hard knocks boy I love my coffee I'm not the same without my coffee I've got to get my shot I didn't say my jab <laughs> let me move on quickly <laughs> hallelujah got to get my shot of coffee something <laughs> about coffee but those must have been difficult days okay the shortages of World War II will pale however the shortages of World War II that we just alluded to will pale in comparison to the deprivations. The things that persons left behind will be deprived of. The deprivations that will be suffered by those left to endure the great tribulation. Let me tell you all something this morning. I want the first bus out of this place. 
I want the first bus out of this bed. I'm not sticking around. I don't want to be hanging around to see what life is going to be like after the rapture and hope that by some God's grace somewhere or another, even though the Holy Spirit would have been removed with the church because that's why he's here to fill the church. And so by some grace of God, I will allow them to cut my head off so I could be numbered by miraculously amongst those righteous which could happen, but think of what I got to go through just to get amongst the righteous when all I need to do now is to listen, apply the word, and to obey his principles. Anybody looking for the rapture? Give Jesus a mighty hand of praise this morning. I want the first bus out. I want the first bus out of here, man. A season of shortages. Also, we're going to see, secondly, a season of starvation. This third horse is still dealing with a black fella. This black horse that's indicative of famine. You'll also see with this seal and scroll and the judgment of God unfurled on a godless generation that has been left behind after the bride of Christ has been removed. We're going to see a season of starvation. Verse 6 tells us something of the problems that will exist during that time. Verse 6 reads. And I heard something like a voice. In the midst of the four living creatures. Saying a quart of wheat for a denarius. A day's wages. Three quarts of barley for a denarius. Do not damage the oil and the wine. I want us to see something here. A biblical quart. Depending on the translation that you're reading from. Some translations use the word measure. Some will use the word ration. I think the King James uses the word measure. The Amplified uses the word quart. <clears throat> Whichever. Quart, measure, ration. I want you to understand that that biblical quart would be enough food to feed a grown working man. <clears throat> a grown working man. This is enough food to feed a grown man who works hard every day. I don't like to, to call names necessarily and pick on people, but, but forgive me. Let me just throw this one in here. This is enough food then given by the, uh, what the statisticians tell us, the biblical court. It would be sufficient to feed a man like Newton. Hardworking man. A grown man. When Newton sit down to eat, he, he eating a monkey food. He's a hardworking man. Okay, say amen, brother. Say amen. Wave a hand. Do something. <laughs> okay. So, we have before us this portion of food, this plate of food, and it is enough, the quart would be, the biblical quart, for one day's meal. One day's meal for one man like Newton. A penny refers to a denarius, as is indicated. Some translations use the word penny or denarius, which is a day's wages. I want you to see what's going on here. Wheat. Wheat is the food from which bread is made. Barley was used primarily to feed animals. <clears throat> Some of you are familiar with going to get a little barley tea. Yeah? Well, this is not the tea. This is the barley. Barley was used primarily to feed livestock, animals. And at times, get this, at times it was consumed by the very poor. The very poor in our communities would eat barley. What then is being said, pastor? I'm glad you ask. A man then taking now verse 6 and making it simple for every child that is sitting down here this morning. A man will work all day just to be able to buy enough good food. What kind of food? Good food. That's the wheat. Making bread. Good food to feed himself alone. During the great tribulation. During the great tribulation. You go to work whole day. Work hard. Busting a sweat. And what you get in your pocket is sufficient for you 
to, on the way home to get something to eat for you. Nothing to do with your family. Nothing to do with your wife. Nothing to do with your grandchildren. Nothing to do with your neighbor. They didn't know food packages. Put aside a little something for those in the community like the church. This church we're doing other assemblies. None of that. You ain't putting aside none for tomorrow. You don't have enough. It is sufficient to feed you for a day. Tomorrow you go to work again. And what you get is just enough to cover you for your food for that day. You see what's going on there? You have an option though. Listen to the option. <laughs> Listen to the option. Or he can work all day just to buy enough food. Now, it's not good food, but it's just food. It's food fit for an animal, barley, to feed three people. Verse 6 says, three quarts of barley. How many quarts? One ration, one quart covers one man. Three will cover three people. Three quarts of barley for a day's pay. So the option is to buy barley, which is good for animals. But I suppose you could eat it and have enough for two other people. So if you're like me, and they got a family of four, somebody's starving. You understand why I cannot, I can ill afford to be left behind. I can ill afford to be left behind. I want the first bus out of this place. When the trumpet sounds and the dead in Christ rise first, we who remain, the Bible says, shall be caught up together with them in the air. Who died in Christ, in Christ, and rose first. And the Bible says, so shall we meet him, Jesus, in the air. And so shall we be evermore. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. I've come to bring you good comfort this precious morning. To tell somebody, you need to get ready for the rapture. Give Jesus a mighty hand of praise today. I want to get out of this place at the sound of the trumpet. I want you to think about what this means when you unpack this sixth verse. Think about what this means. This is no joke. And this is only the first half we in. Remember I tell you, we got two halves. And the second half is more turbulent. <laughs> People will have to make some hard choices. Hard choice. Hmm. Let me see. Who will I feed here? Hmm. A Dania or Aaron? Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Is this making sense? Are, are you seeing what I'm saying, church? How does a father do that? Hmm. Let me see. Which one can starve tonight? I need to get out of this place, man. I need to get out of this place. I need to get out of this place. People who cannot get out and work for themselves will be left to starve to death so that the workers can eat. It would be an awful time marked with awful, awful starvation. None has ever experienced this type of starvation on this colossal scale. <laughs> Not in this generation or previous. Yet many in our world know the horror of starvation generally all too well. Hang on to these statistics. I'll try to zip through them quickly. Every 3.6 seconds, someone starves to death. Every 3.6 seconds, someone starves to death. Since I said that twice, three people have died of starvation. Think about that. Statisticians tell us approximately... Four million people starve to death every year. Approximately four million people starve to death every year. They die of starvation and related illnesses. Now, 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 now. Let me park my glasses for a moment because I, I, I need, I need, I need to, I need to make a detour here. <laughs> if this is true, and I don't know why statisticians would lie. Four million people die every how much? Year. Okay. I'm made to understand that the global statistics for the deaths that have been related to coronavirus. Hear me this morning. I am told when I watch my TV, 
if I'm to believe mainstream media, which I can't always believe, but if I'm to take them at their word, they will go, no, CD, CDC. They must see no. They must see no. Unless they're trying to sell the world a lie, which, anyhow. <laughs> if what they're saying is true, 4.3 million people have died of coronavirus since it started in March last year. Let's round it off at 18 months. How many you know where I'm going with this baby? In 18 months, 4.3 million people, hear me watching world, have died by coronavirus, if it is true. And I have reason to believe that there are some persons when it was in its height last year who went into the hospital and died of other things, but they were labeled coronavirus. They didn't die from that, but it was tied coronavirus. The bodies were coming in so quickly. The doctors can take time to figure out what the problem was. One fella came in a motorcycle accident and he died. And they call it coronavirus. That's just one example. There must have been many more like that. But throw that out. Let's suppose it's true. 4.3 million people died since the last 18 months of coronavirus. Why is it? That I'm not hearing about these folk over here. The four million who die every 12 months from starvation. But every time I turn on my TV and I put on my radio and I go online, I cannot escape the fact, inverted commas, that 4.3 million people have died of COVID-19, boss. So the fear mongering has taken us by the juggler. And all you can hear is those who have died by COVID-19. I was going to sleep the other day and all I saw was COVID-19 coming at me. The whole world has been raptured by COVID. We've been frozen and we're waiting on someone to unstick us. But nobody ain't talking about these over here. Can I, can, can, can I break it down for you? On a month by month basis, more people are dying of starvation. Four million every 12 months is more than 4.3 million in 18 months. Where are the mathematicians in the house? Are y'all sleeping? Four million in 12 months is more than 4.3 in 18 months, boss. Why am I hearing about COVID only and nobody is telling me how to solve this problem over here called starvation? And it gets worse, worse. Because the solution for COVID primarily is to fatten pockets. The solution. I put it in inverted commas because we're still waiting for it to work. Ouch. <laughs> we're still waiting for it to work. The solution is to fatten pockets that are already fat. But the solution for this starvation will cause them to empty their fat pockets. That's why you're not hearing about this. But you're going to hear about this. And you tell me that you care about life and human beings and neighbors. Deal with this first and get back to me with this after. Help me to solve the starvation. And that's not just the last 12 months. Check your statistics. This has been this is now for the last 2 or 3 decades. Four million people every year. Can you begin to compare that to COVID? So why are we not talking about this? I think you understand why we're not talking about that. I think you understand why we're not. Because there is an answer for this. I'll be coming to it shortly. <laughs> hey, we're coming to it shortly. There are people, just a few, who could deal with that. <laughs> 
one time. Just a few people. Don't take a lot. And they have what it takes, but they're not interested in that. Okay? They're not interested in that. More than 1.3 billion, this is with a B now, more than 1.3 billion people live on less than one U.S. dollar a day. Seven billion people in the world. More than 1.3 billion live on less than one U.S. dollar a day. Another three billion have to try and survive on less than five U.S. dollars a day. As horrible as these figures are, they will be insignificant as compared by the starvation problem that this world will face during the tribulation period. No comparison whatsoever. <laughs> Thirdly, there is a season of separation coming. Season of shortages, season of starvation, season of separation. This phrase, and do not damage the oil and the wine. Do not harm the oil and the wine. You see it there in verse 6. And do not damage the oil and the wine. Wine, 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 wine. This phrase lends two schools of thought. Firstly, this statement may indicate that luxury items will not be affected by the famines. Luxury items may not be affected by the famines. That's the first school of thought. Oil and wine have always been the terms or items of the wealthy set, depending on the type of oil. So this is why I need for transparency, give you both schools of thought this morning, depending on the oil that they're talking about. It has been connected or associated with the wealthy. So to wine. Oil is used in the manufacture of cosmetics. And al alcohol has always been associated with the high life. In other words, while most of the world is plunged into poverty and starvation, the rich will continue to get richer and enjoy their extravagant lifestyles. This divide between rich and poor already exists. Watch this. Consider the following facts. It has been said that the amount of food that the average American puts in the garbage every day could feed an entire family of six people in India. The average amount of food that an American would put in the garbage. I want that. It's spoiled. It's going off. I full. I want it more, mommy. Could feed. A family of six people in India. Two, for the price of one warhead missile, one warhead, a school full of hungry children could eat lunch every day for five years. Did you hear what I just said? I'm going to read that again for you. Because let me tell you something. If you like me, right, this kind of stuff break my heart. When I first came across this, I couldn't, I couldn't wrap my mind around it. This is the world that we're living in, for real, God. For real, son, he said. The price of one missile. <laughs> Could feed a school full of hungry children with lunch. Every day for five years. Oh God. And they're not with one missile. God knows how many missiles they have just waiting for another world war. To show who rules the world. I'm more powerful than you. Okay. What a price to pay to show the world that you're more powerful. Over the last three decades, more than 100 million children died. <laughs> oh, God. More than 100 million children died from starvation and associated illnesses in the last 30 years. Those 100 million deaths could have been prevented, get this, for the price of 10 stealth bombers, 10 fancified aircraft with bombers, with bombs attached to them. If they had sacrificed 10 planes, they could have saved 100 million lives. Jesus. Or, or what the world, not just the U.S., what the world spends on its military upkeep every two days. Every two days. Two days. 
the entire world spends on military upkeep. Sufficient money that could have saved 100 million children's lives. To satisfy the world's hygiene, sanitization, and food requirements would cost us approximately 13 billion with a B US dollars. This is what the United States and the European Union, the EU, spend on perfume every year. On perfume, to smell sweet. To smell sweet. Folk can't eat and they're dying, but at least we smell sweet. So what's the problem? Be good, man. The assets of the three richest men. Connect this now with what I said a few moments ago about the problem over here with starvation versus COVID. Connect this. The assets of the three richest men on the earth are more than the combined GNP, gross national product, of all the least developed countries on the planet. The three richest men have a greater gross national product than all of the least developed countries on the planet. Lord have mercy. These three men, Jeff Bezos, founder of Amazon. Anybody shop there lately? On behalf of Jeff, thanks. Thank you very much. World's largest retailer, estimated net worth $177 billion. <laughs> That's what he's worth. Elon Musk. Elon Musk, CEO of Tesla, estimated net worth $151 billion. That's what he's supposed to be worth. Bernard Arnold. Bernard Arnold, CEO of LVMH, estimated net worth $150 billion. The three of them alone could solve this problem over here. Where four million people wouldn't have to die every year of starvation. But we're not worried about that because COVID is more important. The division between the haves and the have-nots is enormous. But it is only going to grow wider and worse during the tribulation period. Second school of thought under this point, before we move on to the final horse, second school of thought suggests that this is a warning to be very careful when handling olive oil and wine. The second school of thought. Be careful when handling olive oil and wine, which are ordinarily basic commodities, because the great tribulation famine will make them very, very expensive. Whichever school of thought, simply put, get this. The vision seems to indicate that famine and inflation will take such a toll that a laborer will earn only enough to feed himself with wheat or to provide barley for a small family. He will have almost nothing left for clothing, shelter, incidentals, etc. Either way, my friends, you and I can ill afford to be left behind. You can ill afford to be left behind. This final horse, the fourth horse, this final horse, the fourth horse, indicative and representative of the fourth seal, this horse and its horseman, the pale horse, is a horse of desolation. This stallion and its jockey represent desolation and death. The pale horse of desolation. I couch it as Desolation. Let's look at verse 7 and 8. Amplified version, 7 and 8, Revelation 6. When he, the lamb, broke open the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature call out, Come! So I looked, and behold, an ashen, pale, greenish, gray horse, like a corpse, representing death and pestilence. And its rider's name was Death. And Hades, the realm of the dead, was following with him. They were given authority and power over a fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword and with famine and with plague, pestilence, disease, and by the wild beasts of the earth. There endeth the reading. This fourth horse is said to be pale in color. 
The word pale comes from the same Greek word that gives us our English words chlorophyll and chlorine. Okay, those of you who like taking notes, this is good stuff. Hey, but by the way, incidentally, anybody getting anything out of this message this morning so far? By the way, just, just throwing that out there. Okay, a few of you. The rest of you stay tuned. <laughs> Maybe this is like, you know, straightforward stuff. You knew this anyhow, so now I haven't learned anything new, Pastor. Keep going. Okay, stay tuned. <laughs> this word pale, P-A-L-E, comes from a Greek word that means chlorophyll or chlorine. Stay there. Stay there for a moment because they're not green, but they lead to that which is greenish and grayish. The word means green. It refers to the sickly yellow-green paleness of a corpse. So the word that we are reading, that we see, refers then to the sickly yellow-green paleness of a corpse. The events that take place in the wake of this stallion and its rider are also the things that will follow a time of war. However, these events seem to take place independently from those which have gone before it and those which preceded. We are told that the rider of this pale horse is death, okay? You saw that, capital D, death. We are also told that hell or Hades follows behind him. The word death speaks of the death of the body, not the soul, the body, the death of the body. That's why when you go to a funeral, you will hear the minister say, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. The body goes back to the dust, back to the ground. It refers to the death of the body. The word hell reminds us that there is a horrible, Christless eternity awaiting the souls of men, those who will not repent for their sins. Two things before we close under this point of the fourth horse. This horse, this pale horse, pale horse of desolation. First of all, the magnitude of the desolation. And secondly, the method of the desolation. The magnitude. We are told that death will claim one quarter of the world's population. Did you read that? I read it. One fourth of the earth. Verse 8. One fourth of the earth. Or one fourth part of the earth. To kill with the sword, etc. So, quickly... Capture this. Those of you who like figures, yeah, you'll, you'll, you'll figure this out. <laughs> Death will claim one quarter of the world's population. This is one out of every four people. Now, I, I, need, some, I need some help here. I need some help. I, I want four people on this side just to get up on your feet. Any four. It doesn't matter. First four. One, two, uh, three, four. Okay, good. That's good. Sit, sit, remain standing. Remain standing. Dalton. Peter, William sat back down. Who, who, oh, oh, I didn't even see the young man standing. What's your name? Nicholas. Dalton, Nicholas, Peter, Jabari. One of these four will die. Let's just presuppose that these four are left behind. And I pray not. Somebody help me pray not. <laughs> According to the word of the Lord, one of these four, all four left behind, but one of these four will die in this period of time that we're now tra tra trucking through, that we're tracking through as we talk about the fourth seal. And this is still the first part. We've not gotten to the, the, the second half of the tribulation yet, which is turbular. <laughs> one of these four going to die in this horrible, horrible death that we're talking about. Give them a good hand. Pray for them. They may be seated. Now you can pretty much do that in your pew on those pews around you. You can do that 
in your household, those who live on that, that roof with you. You can do that in your neighborhood. You can do that on your job. <laughs> you, you can do that in your school. You can do that in your contacts list. Open up your WhatsApp and just begin scrolling and count one, two, three, four, one, you're dead. One, two, three, four, one, you're dead. I want to, I'm doing it this way. Why? Because I wanted to see how real this is. You are talking about one in every four people living during those days. And if you take today's population of seven billion people, my friends, you are talking about the death of 1.75 billion people. Suddenly, the figures just went off the chart. Because in your mind, as in my mind, I have no idea what 1.75 billion people look like. I can't even muster the 280,000 people here in Barbados. So then I see a big crowd somewhere about in the place. So let me real people. And then I realized, but you know what, Barbados got 280,000. So you know what, there ain't nobody at all that, that they saw that gathered from that pasture. They ain't saying nothing. 1.7, I did not say million. Somebody shout B, Pastor B. 1.7 billion people dying this horrible, horrible death. If we use today's figure of 7 billion people. And this is still the first half. Consider quickly the method of the desolation. The methods that death will use. The claim this great number of persons are listed in this verse, this eighth verse. The four methods that are mentioned are the sword, the famine, the diseases, and the beasts. If you're taking notes, the sword, the famine, the diseases, and the beasts. Firstly, the sword. This refers to warfare, okay? More war. It's not over. It's only going to get worse. During this period of time, it is almost certain that wars will be both conventional as well as nuclear in nature. And we already have nuclear warheads available. Mankind has nuclear warheads at the snap of a finger. If you, if you, if you, if you touch me, one, one, one power, uh, world power will say to the other, if you breathe in a way that I don't like, I can deal with you because at the press of a button... We could finish this today, boss. Don't, 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 don't start me. <laughs> and they're just waiting. And tensions are rising. And they will continue to rise. So some countries will use nuclear weapons in warfare for sure. Some countries are already using biochemical weapons. As I mentioned last Sunday. Hello? <sighs> How did COVID start? <laughs> for already using biochemical weapons. Okay, this is not far-fetched. And get this, I don't know how many of you are aware of this, but I, I, I stumbled on this recently. Only time will tell just how accurate this will be. Only time, not a prophet or the son of a prophet, but I can tell you this is what I've stumbled on. COVID-19 and the purported COVID-2022. COVID-19 and the purported COVID-22 viruses are exactly that, biochemical weapons. Okay? Time will tell what happens in 22. The numbers that will die in these wars at this time during the Great Tribulation will be astronomical. Consider famine. We have already talked about the problem of starvation, so I'm not going to rehash that. I think you get that point already. There, there was an entire seal, a horse, a whole animal, <laughs> and its rider was already dedicated to famine and the business of the deprivations that will take place on the earth at that time. So we understand that we're talking about something that is with global scope. During the Great Tribulation, many millions will meet their deaths in this fashion relative to famine. So that's the sword. That's the famine. Thirdly, the diseases. This refers to deaths apart from warfare and famine. So it's not just warfare, death by warfare. 
or death by famine. But now you've got diseases. I'm talking about genuine diseases. And I deliberately use the word genuine. <laughs> Not that they were concocted and therefore are real, which I believe that COVID certainly is real. But I'm talking about those that, were, that are genuinely bred and not fashioned and forged. Are you hearing what I'm saying, church? Diseases, Jesus treated as Matthew 24, 7. For nations shall rise against nation, and as you heard already, kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in different places. So we know that diseases are real, as COVID is real. I remember there was a period of time when it first came out, and you all know this perhaps better than me, that a lot of people, a lot of talk was going around that it is not real. Don't mind them and that foolishness. It is not real. Not COVID, what? Nonsense. But obviously, this thing is real. It is not something to be played with or toyed with or looked dimly on. But I'm talking now about genuine pestilences. Okay, uh, and Jesus said that this will also happen, and people will die in the millions by diseases at that time, those who are left behind. The word pestilences, and I mentioned this last Sunday, so I'm not going to take time on this, refers to pandemic in the original Hebrew and even into the Koine Greek. Pestilences infer diseases that will run rampant throughout the human race during this time of the great tribulation. Many millions will lay dead in their wake. And this is entirely possible. Remember the Spanish flu? Hmm? During World War I, I'm made to understand 25 million people died with the influenza. In a world that knew nothing of overnight travel or international travel. As a matter of fact, I'm also made to understand that thrice as many people died of the virus than died in battle. In the middle of a war, you know, World War I. Three times as many people died with the virus as opposed to those who died in battle. So we understand that diseases are real and diseases will take lives by the millions. An unchecked outbreak of that sort has the potential to kill hundreds of millions of people within a few months if left unchecked. Finally, the beasts of Revelation chapter 6 verse 8. The beasts. Now, I need to tell you uh, in the Greek, because if you just read it in the English, you wouldn't really pick this up. In the Greek, the beasts that we're talking about here refer to animals, animal attacks, the attacks of animals, which will account for many deaths, apparently. But the word beasts can refer to small animals as well as rodents. I, thought, I found this to be profound. Because when I just read it in the English and I saw beasts, you know what came to my mind? Lions, tigers, leopards. You know all them big fellas that you and I would run from? Bears. <laughs> but in the original, it actually didn't necessarily deal with them. It, 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 it references small animals and it also encompasses rodents. Well, I wouldn't have called that a beast, but that's what the original word lends itself to. But I can understand the beastly nature of the rodent. Watch this. The Bible does not say specifically, but it could be referring to rats. Stay with me. The Bible does not say, for transparency, I need to put that out there, that it is rats. But it could be, I appeal to your imagination, it could refer to to rats, and you may understand better why I, I go there as, as I share some of these statistics. Quickly, the following stats relative to rats. The estimated warfare, death, vermin, and carnage at this time during the Great Tribulation would cause the rat population of this world to explode exponentially. Think of all the carnage that will be left. Because we're talking about all this death, and all this desolation, all this destruction, all this disease. Can you begin to picture that the rats now having a field there, boss? Who's cleaning up the bodies? Answer me that. Who's burying these bodies? We're the priests. We're the pastors. 
Nowhere. Who's bur- who's looking after? Where are the funeral homes? What are they doing? Who's looking after the burial, the decent disposure of these bodies? So the rat population explodes exponentially. Secondly, if 95%, get this, 95% of the rat population in a given area is destroyed, okay? They can replenish their numbers in one year. One year. If 95% of them were removed or eradicated. Rats carry approximately 35 known diseases. Hmm. Known. Nothing to do with those that are unknown. Fourthly, rats were responsible for killing one third of the European population while the bubonic plague was raging. One in every three people of the European population during the bubonic plague, and this was in the Middle Ages, one in every three people that died, it was the fault of a rat. So when somebody calls you a rat, (laughs) lastly, every year, rats destroy approximately one billion with a B, U.S. dollars. One billion with a B. U.S. dollars in food in the United States alone. Ouch. I believe that this beastly invasion, that's all I could call it, this beastly invasion might have something to do with rats during the Great Tribulation. In closing, when I think on these things, two things come to my mind, beloved. Two things come to my mind. First of all, I thank God that I'm saved by his grace. And that I am not going to be here for any of this when it unfurls on this sinful, indifferent, lackadaisical, lackluster, obstinate, wicked, irreverent generation. I thank God. That by his grace, and his grace alone, I stand. Anybody here like that today? Just wave at me if if you plan to be out of here. Out of this place. I thank God for that. Now, no one knows. No one knows how bad things will get. Between now and when the Lord Jesus Christ comes for his bride. But we are already seeing semblances, as I mentioned to you last Sunday and again today, of some of these things on our doorstep. We are already seeing signs of these things. But I thank God today again. I thank God today. I've got to thank Him because Andre can't stand on his own strength. I thank God today that I'm leaving this old, rotten, God-forsaken world for a better place. And as I said already and I say again, I want the first bus out of here. (laughs) Secondly, my heart breaks. And I grieve for those who will be left behind. For those who have no saving knowledge of Christ. Who have never made a decision to ask Christ to forgive them of their sins. My heart breaks for persons Persons in our contacts list. Persons in our homes. Family members that you and I have. Friends, colleagues at work. Anybody hearing what I'm saying to you? Everybody in here can think of somebody in their neck of the woods who you know in your heart is not right with God. They have not asked Christ to be merciful to them. They have not bowed their knee to Jesus Christ and made him Lord and Savior of their lives. And my heart aches and breaks. I remember many years ago, God gave me a vision of souls going down to hell. Just being flown into hell. In their droves. And I asked God about it. And he reminded me concerning his word. That there are more going down there than there are who will not go down there. For the road to hell is broad. And many they are that travel on it. But the road to heaven is narrow. It's a narrow way, friend. And I ask you today as I...
pray, God, that you're looking into the crevices of your heart and you're feeling the pain that I feel, not just for those who maybe even in this building, but for those who are close to you by way of lineage. Can you get a vision? Get a vision. Not that you want them to go there, but get a vision of them going there and then ask God to help you to get them out of that pathway, that broad way. Listen, friends, people are on broad street going down to hell. And I put it to you that way as a Barbadian community because when I say broad street, it should, it should click with you. It might not click with those in America or those in Haiti or Nicaragua, or Dubai, who watch us every Sunday, but it should click with you all. Any Bajans in the house? Broad street. It is, a, it is a street in this country, and I'm told it's supposed to be the main street. So too is hell. The main pathway, and people are going down to hell. My heart breaks for them. If you are not saved, Today, my friend, I ask you to come to Jesus. If you're not saved and you've not made peace with God, come to Jesus Christ and ask him and he and he alone for salvation. No man can do it for you. No angel can do it for you. No pastor, no evangelist, no good friend, no spouse. Come to Christ and Christ alone for salvation. Your lost soul is at stake today. It is at stake. It is at stake. If you're out of his will, I pray today that you come back so that your life can be lived in light of his glory. And I don't know why I'm going in this direction, but I feel the spirit of God, so I'm going to go there. While the band plays something softly, thank you so much, Dr. Elvis. If you have people on your heart, listen to me today. If you've got people on your heart that you need to forgive, do it today. Do it today. You say, Pastor, forgiveness is hard. I understand. Trust me. I could write a library. Not a book, a library. <laughs> on letting go of people who have hurt you, people who have wronged you. I could write a bestseller about helping people to let go of past hurts. Pastors have to help people walk through some stuff. I've had my own journey. And I've helped others walk through theirs. I'm asking you today by the grace of God. Jesus will help you. You don't have to do it alone. Put the thing at the foot of the cross. And every time you hear the name of the person. Every time you see a picture. <laughs> pray for that person. It can be hard. It can be like eating nails at first. But pray, 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 pray for them. At first, it can be a two-second prayer. <laughs> you continue. In another week or two, you'll be praying for them for two minutes. By this time next year, God's prayer life, you'll be praying for them for a whole 15 minutes. Praying good things. God bless them. Bless them. Prosper their lives. God, I leave, I leave that person or those people at your, at your foot, your footstool, the foot of your cross. And you do with them as you see fit, God. I turn them over to you, Lord. I know it's going to be hard. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not pretending on this, guys. Hear me today. I know it's going to be like swallowing nails. But you, there's a thing, beautiful thing about forgiveness. It's not for them. It is for you. It is for you. If you, if you do not forgive all of these ghastly things that I've talked about, in these four seals, in the first few verses of this sixth chapter of the book of Revelation, relative to the stallions and their riders, these things will be your lot in the next 
generation. If you do not learn to let them go. Let the people go, man. Because it's only going to poison your soul. I want to pray for you today, friends. I want everyone to stand. If you would, stand with me. You're here today and you say, Pastor, there's someone in my family or someones in my neck of the woods, at work, in my neighborhood, and they're not saved. I know they're not living for God. This is not about judging anybody. I know that they are not right with you. By their fruit, they will be known. Hmm? If that's you, and you're like me, and you know people, they're not right with God. Just raise your hand and take it down. Just raise it and take it down. Thank you. Father and God, I pray that you took a snapshot of those hands that went up. Some went up halfway. Some went up all the way. But if there be any one or ones in our lives whom we have influence over, I pray two things. First of all, I pray that we will have the courage to live our lives in such a way that we would be good representatives of the cross of Christ. That we would be good representations of Jesus. And that our lives, our lifestyles, and our words would depict Jesus and that we wouldn't turn people away from Christ, but that we would actually draw all manner of men and women to Jesus. For you said, if you be lifted up, <laughs> you will draw all men unto yourself. This is the generation that needs to lift Jesus higher. And I pray that we would do that. I pray that we would have the courage and the testicular fortitude to open our mouths as well as our hearts and tell of others, tell others of Christ and the fact that he's still saving souls. Secondly, I pray, God, for those persons who you will direct us to. I believe sincerely with all of my heart, you will take us to persons. There are people who you will cause us to call. There are people who we will, we will pick up the phone and we're going to WhatsApp people. Some of us will WhatsApp people before the day is over. Others of us are going to reach out to persons on Facebook. Others of us will go and knock on doors. Others of us will interact with persons at work. However it happens, I pray that as the interaction takes place, that you will prepare the hearts of friends, family members, neighbors, colleagues, subordinates, bosses. I pray you prepare the fallow ground. Break up that fallow ground. Prepare their hearts today so that when we approach them, it won't be tough evangelizing. It's going to come natural. And the testimonies that will be returned to this house will indicate that you went before every single last one of us. God, I thank you for that. Water, I pray, our hearts as you do their hearts and prepare them for a word of encouragement as they seek to make sense out of a world that is unraveling. Oh God. God, I pray that you help us to ready ourselves so that we can get out of this place before the bottom of life drops out from it because it is dropping out. It is dropping out. Maybe you're here today and you've never asked Christ into your heart. I want to pray for you today. I'm going to lead you in a simple prayer. Simple prayer. If that is you today and you know in your own heart you need to make peace with God, just repeat this prayer after me and mean it with everything inside of you. Pray like this. Lord Jesus, I come to you today. I confess I am a sinner and I need a Savior. I put my trust in your shed blood. Lord Jesus, you came to this world. You forsook the glory of heaven. And you came to this earth for people like me. You came for souls. 
I am a soul today. You shed your blood on a cruel cross for people like me. I receive your gift of salvation in the name of Jesus. By faith, I sprinkle my life with the blood of Christ. And I thank you for canceling my sin debt. Thank you, Lord, for writing my name in your book of life with all the names of those who will populate heaven and will not plunder hell. My name is in that book. I stand on your grace, unmerited favor, your mercies. I embrace them today and I appropriate it to my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Put your hands together for what Christ did for you, son of God, child of God. Daughter of Zion, put your hands together for the king today. Now next week, next week, I'm going to continue in this theme with a slight change of gear because we're going to be going into the last three seals. We've looked at the first four, which you understand by now, dealing with the horsemen and their horses. Now we've covered those four seals. Three are remaining. It won't be horses next week or the week after that or the week after that, but the remaining three Sundays in August, we're going to be looking at some tribulation saints. We need to understand that in spite of the best, most valiant efforts of pastors, preachers, evangelists, persons like you and I, who are serious about Christ, people will still be left behind. What will happen to them, Pastor? Don't miss next week, Sunday, as we talk about tribulation saints. And what many of us, well, <laughs> Many people, not us, <laughs> will have to endure because we didn't take the good advice that was given in this dispensation. God is so merciful that though it will be hell on earth, you will still be able to be numbered amongst the righteous. But you don't want the second bus. You want the first bus this place. Fathers, we go from this house. I pray, God, that you watch over us. Keep us safe. There's a wicked devil out there, and it seems as though he's gone mad. He knows his time is short, and he's doing everything he can to capture as many in his net as possible. But I'm asking that you watch between us as you sprinkle the blood around us. Watch over our homes, our houses, our business places, our offices, our vehicles, our cars. My God, our feet, our chosen mode of transportation. Watch over us. Keep our minds at peace and our hearts enraptured as we anticipate your soon return. Bring us back safely next Sunday. In Jesus' mighty name, somebody shout amen. Now I want you to go on ahead and tell others what's happening in your church so that this place is packed as much as is possible next week's Sunday. All right? Can I get an amen on that? God bless you. Please go home, get on Facebook, get on YouTube, share the video file that went out. Don't just ignore it. Share it, like it, love it. Do something with it. Comment on it. Get it out to a watching world that's going down to hell in a handbasket. See you on Facebook and YouTube. God bless you. Love you all. Bye-bye. Our friends on YouTube, God bless you. Thank you for subscribing. If you have not done that, please subscribe to our Calvary Temple Community Church Barbados. Go on there on the link right there on that, on that channel and subscribe if you would. More power to you. Thank you all for journeying with us today. It's been a joy of mine this past hour to bring you the Word of God and to pray with you and believe God for greater things on your behalf. Those of you who would like to continue giving or maybe if you would like to comments giving to our online platform or online church you will see the number at the bottom of your screen there 
or CIBC Savings Account Bank, and you will see that number. I encourage you to jot it down and uh, use it as the Lord will lead you along. Thank you for every gift you give, and I prophesy blessings over your life. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit of God, God bless you from CTCC. Bye-bye.